No. I had you going there, didn't I? Yeah, the song has nothing to do with the comics or the freaking lore behind Iron Man. And quite frankly, pisses me off. But enough about that. Let's get right into the review today. I have decided, as part of the Will Review for Food in between episodes, mostly like maybe whenever I feel like doing an episode or there hasn't been an, uh, a dub episode out in a while, I'm going to be doing the movies leading up to the Avengers and then doing a cumulative Avengers review. So I've got quite a few reviews lined up, considering there's five movies that I have to go through, and I will be giving a review of all of them. So without further ado, let's just get right into the first movie... Iron Man, made in 2008. Iron Man is one of Marvel's top-tier characters to start with, being able to withstand the test of time and still have enough mojo to hang around with today's greats. It's not without reason, either. The story of the son of a billionaire in the weapons industry isn't exactly original, but what they did to make the character stand out was. Since we're reviewing the movie, let's just stick with that origin. I haven't yet had the chance to sit down and read my copy of Iron Man's origin issue, so the movie is all I have to go off of. During a tour of Afghanistan, weapons expert and manufacturer Tony Stark is thrown into combat when his military transport vehicle is driven into the line of fire. Startled and dazed, Stark stumbles from the jeep and takes cover behind a nearby rock. Soon after, an enemy missile lands not far from him, bearing the name Stark Industries on it. Oh, irony, you are such a bitch. Seriously, though, after this opening, you can imagine how pumped the audiences were. Our hero is hurt. He's not okay. What will he do? When situations like these pop up in movies, it automatically makes tension skyrocket, especially in movies based off superheroes who are known to be able to survive almost any accident. And when you put a regular man in a real situation like war, it makes that tension rise even higher. After waking up in an unfamiliar and hostile environment, it is revealed that Tony Stark is now a prisoner of the Afghan insurgents, and the missile did more damage than anyone had hoped for. We see that the only thing keeping Tony alive is a car battery and a magnet that is holding bits of shrapnel back from entering and or puncturing his heart. I can't imagine he'd be able to do much work with a punctured heart, and just imagine the medical bill. Yeesh. Anyway, we find out Tony is not alone in his prison cell, and he has a partner called Yin Sen that helps him escape later on. Okay. You know what? I think it's time someone takes a stand for the other side. Why can't a prisoner just stay captured, damn it? It's not fair! Tony is given demands to make a destructive weapon with whatever they see fit to give him, and he MacGyvers a miniature arc reactor so that he's not strapped to the car battery. The arc reactor serves the same purpose, but it's a little more efficient. After some time spent dicking around with the materials and making a giant suit to escape instead of what they were supposed to make, Tony finally breaks out. What?! A billionaire weapons manufacturer doesn't want to stay put in his cell and decides to fight for his freedom? What manner of witchcraft is this? Tony flies into the air and everyone stares in awe as the one and only chance they had at world domination flies away into the bright afternoon sun. And then crashes in the desert somewhere a ways away. So majestic! He's found, returned home, given a cheeseburger and a few hours to himself to do whatever it is geniuses do in their spare time. In this case, he builds a robot suit. For killing. You know, for the kids. After a lot of filler and action scenes involving Tony flying the suit, it's revealed that Tony has officially stopped making weapons and has turned over a new leaf. And this time, it's a leaf that actually doesn't have thousands of tiny little micro mines on the bottom of it. Obadiah Stane, Tony's good friend and obvious antagonist, was revealed to be using Tony to get what he wants. Namely, a robot suit just like Tony's. In a world ruled by jealousy, a man acting like a five-year-old saying, Gimme, gimme, will build a suit. Tony shuts him down, wins the battle, and tries to deny any ties to being Iron Man at all. It doesn't work out too well, and he goes ahead and admits that he's an awesome guy with a suit and has the power of an entire platoon, but still won't make weapons. Hey, hey, why don't you tell him to wear a cup before kicking him in the nuts? So, there you have it. Iron Man, the movie that turned a thousand heads and even more Cheeto-stained fingers. In a time where comic book movies weren't exactly big and were often poorly done, it was a breath of fresh air to see an actually decent take on one of the most difficult heroes to portray. Robert Downey Jr. plays the part extremely well, and Gwyneth Paltrow was excellent as Pepper Potts. The only gripe I have with it is minor, but still worth a mention. Tony is very one emotion. My memory may be a little fuzzy in this particular movie, but from what I've seen recently in Iron Man 2 and The Avengers, he really doesn't emote beyond the standard, hey, I'm a billionaire and I'm sarcastically hilarious. While it doesn't really affect the quality of the performance, or the movie as a whole, sometimes the small things can make or break a movie, and if your lead actor is doing something off, it's going to hurt the quality of the movie as a whole. In this case, that's not true. I'll still give Iron Man a 4.8 out of 5. 
Keep an eye out for the first dubbed issue of Ultimate Spider-Man and the next we'll review for food, which is The Incredible Hulk.